Dublin Corporation's offices are among the most controversial buildings in Ireland. When I came here first, I was looking for a less contentious building, a home of my own. It was quite an experience. In From the Margins contacted 28 local authorities throughout the country to ask what was their housing policy for people with disabilities. Not one had such a policy, and only two, Waterford and North Tipperary, are making an effort in this regard. There are nearly 200 people with disabilities on local authority waiting lists for houses, and that's just the tip of the iceberg of people with disabilities who want to live independently. with disabilities are waiting for someone to die so that they can get into institutional residential care. This has been called the most scandalous queue in Ireland, not least because nobody really chooses to go there. Many young people with disabilities live in geriatric and county homes, long stay wards in general hospitals and in other residential care institutions. It is hard to live with dignity without privacy, without choice as to when we get up or go to bed, when we go to the toilet or who helps us in the bathroom. Not all residential care institutions are like this, but too many are. Residential care may be the only grim alternative to feeling like a burden in the family home. Well, I felt it was time to make a break. Um, parents forget that you're an adult and inclined to treat you as if you're a child. So I decided to leave. And um, the first church home I went to was and um, I was there three and a half months and it was really regimental, you run type thing. You get up at 8.30, breakfast is at nine, you have to be down for it. And um, by half now you're probably finished. And um, after breakfast, there's a thing called what's done the changes where most of the residents go to the toilet and you have to go at certain times. You can't really go when you want to go because they said to be bringing people all day if that was the case. I fought. I was fighting nonstop um, just for simple rights, you know, like people knocking on my door um, asking to be dressed the way I want to be dressed, to be washed, to, to get food the way I want it cooked. Uh, it, it was just one long, hard battle. And I was battling it on my own because uh, I was working and I felt I had this right to demand services and I, all of the residents weren't working. And so they thought I was actually being an upstart. I was pushing for things that were not necessary, simple things like demanding to stay up at night. You know, when I went there, it was bed at half eight because I couldn't put myself to bed. So, like, it was, it was cruel. Uh, people think that uh, in here people have help, etc., to do the things that they want to do. But that's very, very fine. But in actual fact, the reality of this, it makes them a hostage of wherever they might be in, in the sense that right there, there are staff available to assist people in and out of bed, to move from place to place within the four walls. But could you just imagine living your life in your own bedroom? I mean, it's not so cruel now, but it's not so great either. Like, there's still nothing for people to do all day long, and they're actually there isn't even demands made on them to get up and do something on the residents themselves. And I think that's very wrong because nobody gets anything for nothing in this life, you know. It's encouraging people to become dependent rather than independent. So in my book, it, it actually goes very much against the tide of, of opinion or of where, where people really want to go. Uh, it's also, it institutionalizes people very quickly. And I'm not speaking about buildings institutionalizing people in terms of buildings. I'm speaking in terms of how it institutionalizes them in their mind, where they're all the time depending on everybody around them and the, the routine. 
to make up their minds for them, literally at every, at every hand's turn. What about your privacy in a situation like that? <laughs> it's virtually yeah. not heard of. I mean, you could be in the shower. I know anyone could walk in. Well, it could be staff, but they seem to forget to close the door. Same when you go to the loo. It was a fight every day to get your dignity, privacy, or whatever. Just wouldn't hear of it at all. You know. Can you, can you describe what would happen, or what might have happened when you would say, could you close the door? Well, the girls might close it and just, you know, wouldn't think about it, but the senior staff, which would be the nurses, which would be the older ones, would say, um, well, if there was another resident outside that was waiting to use the loo, they said they couldn't close it because they had to watch her, which seemed a bit stupid to me. It's not as if she was going to go anywhere, you know? So um, often the door would be left slightly open, you know? And if anyone was passing, you know, it was just a case they could see her. So every day this was going on. I used to just dread going to the toilet and it might seem a bit silly, but I did. Everything physically is done for you in the Cheshire home. Every decision is made for you um, in relation to what time you get up, almost to what clothes you're going to wear today, um, what food you're going to eat, and in some cases, what time you're going to go to the toilet. Um, but your mind, you, you don't actually decide what road your life is going to go down. Because they've made all these deci decisions for you, you're, you just, you're almost limp. You, you don't know what you want at the end of the day. They, they've actually taken away your whole being and made it easy, all right, but it's not good for you, for life to be so easy. Uh, there was always orders. You wanted to do certain things, you would say, well, matron won't like that, or you can't do this, you know? Because um, a lot of them seem afraid, to be quite honest. To, when you're going to like, you get a list of rules from the other residents, don't do this, and matron won't like that. And um, they just seem generally very afraid of her, you know? Jackie's search for a place like home has ended in the new Cheshire home in Monkstown, County Dublin. Choice and control in the things she does is part of the worldwide demand of people with disabilities for the right to live independently. That doesn't mean doing everything yourself. Independent living means calling the shots, deciding what you want to do and when you want to do it, and enlisting the help of others as, when and how you choose. <laughs> At the Cheshire home in Monkstown, Jackie has her own hall door and a real say in how the centre is run. Later this year, the Cheshire Foundation, as part of its ongoing commitment to independent living, will open a housing complex in Sligo which will be run entirely by the residents. Sharing, equality and a healthy rural life are the ideals of the Camp Hill communities. Here at Ballytobin, near Callan in County Kilkenny, people with a mental handicap and unpaid volunteers live, work, learn and celebrate together. The community keeps animals and grows its own food. Traditionally, institutional care is the lot of many people with learning disabilities, but Campbell offers an attractive alternative. Everyone eats together and joins in the making of decisions. There is a strong sense of religious belief and of taking pleasure in the ordinary events of everyday life. Clearly, the lifestyle wouldn't suit everybody, but enough people are attracted to it to fill the 70 Camp Hill communities worldwide, including four in Ireland. There are plans to extend the Camp Hill communities to involve people with mental illness, but there are no comparable options available to people with physical disabilities. And, as with so many innovative schemes in Ireland, Camp Hill relies on fundraising to make up the difference between government grants and the real costs. Camp Hill's vision of family life doesn't appeal to everyone. Some people 
prefer the freedom of their own space and the privacy of their own hall door. But because of current housing design, finding a suitable property can be a long, tedious process for people with physical disabilities, as Ursula Hegarty found. We looked for a solid four years before we found a house. Because I, well, I wanted one in near my job, um, but within walking distance to my job. Not too pricey, which is the, well, that's what it is, around Herbert Street, Baggett Street, Pierce Street, all around there, you, you just pay for your house. Um, and that, that was why I waited. I wanted a bungalow as well, which is very hard to find. Um, first of all, we thought the best road to go down would be to apply to Dublin Corporation. Um, we were, I was on that list for four years and nothing. I mean, I never even got a phone call to say, you have moved up the ladder or you, you're gone way down again or nothing. Um, the, when I applied, uh, somebody came in actually to v view my room in the barrage to see was it acceptable to sleep in such tight quarters. And it was acceptable for two people to live in, in such areas because there was the, the toilets and the bathrooms were all off it. So we weren't actually living grotty, you know, like it, we just had to sleep in this room and that was perceived to be okay. So I suppose that was why I was never moved up the ladder, as it were. Despite her lack of progress with the corporation's housing department, Ursula persevered with her plans for independent living in a place of her own. I used to dream about it, you know, um, I wouldn't like to be negative and say it's not an option or it's it's not even to be considered. Um, but if they do consider it, they're on their own. And it's very hard if you're on your own. Um, I wouldn't treat it very lightly. There's, there's a lot of new, even, even just basic things of paying a bill. I mean, when you're living in a Cheshire home, you're protected you never have to worry, is, is the water going to be hot? Is there going to be enough milk for my tea? Because it's always there and you don't have to worry about if there's money in your pocket to pay for it. So there's just down to the, even the simplest things have to be decided and it's different. Yeah. I have a partner, but I mean, nothing is infallible. I mean, you, you can't say you have everything forever, you know. So I'd like to think at the end of the day, should anything happen between Jimmy and I, that like, I could have carers 24 hours a day. Um, uh, but I, I hire and fire, that's what I'd like to see. <laughs> Ursula's dream of hiring, firing and controlling her own personal assistant on a 24-hour-a-day basis is not as far-fetched as the current situation in Ireland suggests. In Denmark, the concept is a reality. Of course, you must have your privacy. You must have your private life. And this is the first step to, to have a family, to have a work, to have a, a life that can, you know, be something like the rest of the, the society. The man with overall responsibility for this rock concert is Ewald Krog, who is president of the Muscular Dystrophy Association of Denmark. He is also the man who started up the independent living movement in Denmark 13 years ago. A dynamic organiser, Ewald has a team of four personal assistants. Their help enables him to make his significant contribution to public life. On his frequent visits to Ireland, Ewald brings two of his helpers with him. I can, I will not mention the names of airline companies that I don't travel with. But I have my favorites. Air Lingus is one of them. I must say that uh, when I come back so often, 
it's not because I have to. It's because I think it's my second hope. But I'm not living here every day, and as a tourist, I have many good friends in Ireland. I like the personality of the, the population, the, the culture of the country, I think, is undescribable. Uh, I'm very much impressed of the way you think. I like your chaotic way of, of thinking because it's in some other way it's organized, and I like the, the music and the culture, the pop culture. I like your black stuff, the Guinness. <coughs> I have always been very happy to enter the airport of Dublin. And uh, uh, years ago, I wondered how big the contrast, in fact, was, because in the airport of Dublin, there was all kinds of help. You need not go on one step. If there were steps, they had special machines to come out to the airplanes and really, you know, top class, first class. When I'm in Ireland these five days, I bring two helpers with me. And they, they are my legs and my arms. And this is necessary for me to travel around in the whole world. I mean, it's not uh, easy to be handicapped. I normally say it's not a catastrophe to have muscular dystrophy, but it's really unpractical. But on the other hand, I must admit, when I came outside the airport area, maybe there was a few things to talk about when we talk about the circumstances for people with different disabilities, which I, which, which shocked, shocked me in, in many ways, I must say. In Aarhus, where Ivald lives, people with disabilities are funded by the local authority to employ their own assistants. The scheme saves the authority money that would otherwise have been spent on impersonal institutions. So how does the system work? They count how much, how much time of the day and night do you need help? How much time can you manage alone? And of course it differs from person to person. And to me, I can not be alone for many seconds. And uh, maybe some people could be alone half of, maybe in the night, and then they'll say, okay, 95 hours per week for you, my friend. Can you outline that process that started 13 years ago? In the beginning, I had to rely on, on uh, many volunteer people, friends, and I found a girlfriend, and of course, she took up, looked after me quite many hours of the day, but she had to work also. Little by little, I persuaded to get more and more hours per day. I've always had the same amount of muscular dystrophy, uh, and th this will never change. But uh, it's, it's, you know, it's like to make a good deal. I, I said, when I knew I got 40, I could get 40 hours, I said, I need 59. Then I knew they would say, OK, you'll get 40. They thought they sneaked me, or, you know, and I, I knew that I got 40 was better than 30. And now I have 168 hours per week, because there are not more hours in the day and week. Now, do you get a budget from your municipality and then decide how to spend that? There is a certain amount of money, and you go home and say, OK, I have such amount of money. I put an announcement, advertisement in the papers or whatever. In Denmark, we have an office where you can, where people can come and say, I, I would like to, to apply to be a helper. And the handicapped people can come and say, oh, I, I, I need uh, somebody uh, next weekend because my, my help is ill or whatever. My philosophy is to turn weakness to strength. That weakness is strength. 
because I can act, I can work, I can contribute when I have the necessary help behind me. Supports like the Aarhus scheme are much needed but currently unavailable in Ireland. But Martin Nocton also lives independently with the assistance of a team of volunteers which he has organised for himself. He plans to set up an independent living scheme in Ireland. I live alone but I'm never on my own. I, I need help at all hours of the day and night, all every day of each year, every year. So many years ago I wanted to live independently and uh, I've been lucky. I set up a group of volunteers primarily uh, around me in my community uh, and uh, it has worked really. It allows me to do the things I want to do not the things that necessarily need to be done, and that's terribly important. Uh, when I say that I need support and help at all, at everything, or I think talking, I think they allow me to do that. Uh, I am totally independent in every way because I believe that once you can think for yourself, I mean, everything else, it's just some sort of a support some sort of a crutch that's required. Ronan Hughes, one of his personal assistants, helps Martin with all aspects of his daily life. Through Martin's proposed scheme called NCARE, people with disabilities will employ their own personal assistants. Both the assistants and the disabled people will receive the training and support necessary to make a go of their close working relationship. You're breaking new ground and the security for people with disability who are moving into independent living, and I'm particularly mindful now of people with severe physical disability. It's quite a, it's quite a, it's quite a challenge and quite scary uh, in, in many ways. But, and this is one of the things we hope to address with, through the organization of InCare, you know. We're actually registered as Center for Independent Living uh, limited and we're operating uh, trading under InCare. So it's uh, going to be centrally managed and operated very much on a local basis. Uh, we will give the means, the support and in many cases the training to individuals to manage the program, uh, their program needs in their own area. It's an action research program in the area of uh, training for 15 people with disability, severe physical disability and as well as that we have 35 uh, well carers for the want of a better word uh, who are part of a, a training program as well and they it, it will assist them to get into the whole area of uh, working with people with disability. I'd just like to say that well, I think it was very successful today, our first meeting, and if it's happened to go by, um, in care will be a success. People very often confuse housing with uh, assistance, and they, they talk about, you know, in the past we've been talking about support housing. They forget that people might want to move out to a job during the day, out to training, to college, or whatever. And they, they, so the, in, the issue of assistance, personal assistance services, gets confused with the housing issue. Then they, very often it's seen that, well, disabled people live together. So all of a sudden the answer is group housing. They require special this, special that, and special the other. Which is, I mean, that's how a, 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 these authorities often perceive the thing, and they're very, very wrong. As people with disabilities, we want choice and control over where we live and how we live. Schemes like MCARE are encouraging developments, but touch only the tip of the iceberg. A massive increase in local authority building programs and major changes in the design of new housing are needed. For years, successive governments have talked about the importance of having disabled people live in the wider community. But so far, change has relied more on the energy of individuals than on the implementation of policy. Institutional care is still too many people's only option. 
and it's still only very few of us who can shut our own door, look around and feel truly that there's no place like home.